1965, however, I was still building shelves for Mark's model planes and a window seat for Lynn's room. One spring day, after I had finished constructing a redwood patio and was basking in the sunshine, I turned the page of my newspaper and felt that terrible shock of alarm. I was reading Herb Kahn's popular column in the San Francisco Chronicle, a daily potpourri of interesting chit-chat, when my name jumped out at me. Georg Gärtner. I thought I was seeing things and read the column slowly. My eyes followed the length of the column through the hodgepodge of daily gossip in the Bay Area. Gallery openings, important people currently in town, and musings about a wife-swapping subculture recently discovered by the Chronicle. Then, tucked right in the middle of the column, was a trivia entry regarding the existence of a fugitive German prisoner of war who escaped from Camp Daming twenty years before Georg Gärtner. Wouldn't it be interesting to wonder if Mr. Gärtner, the pride of the Panzers, isn't roaming the streets of San Francisco at this very moment? Herb Cahen speculated. I was stunned. I hadn't seen my real name in print for years and certainly didn't expect to read about myself in the Chronicle. And here I was, living less than 30 miles from downtown San Francisco. Mr. Cahen then went on for another sentence or two to speculate aloud about Georg's impressions of his fair city, the hilly streets, beautiful parks, the gaudy nightclubs of North Beach and uniqueness of the city's ethnic communities. I finished reading the column and tried to control my rising panic. Herb's column was read by hundreds of thousands of people and his interesting tidbits were often the subject of dinner conversations throughout the area. What if everyone began looking for Georg Gaertner? On the other hand, there was no way to link Georg to me. What was I worried about? I just had to stay cautious and keep my nose clean. Still and all, it was a startling intrusion into my new domesticity, and a reminder that, trivia or not, I was a federal fugitive. Ironically, a decade later, Herb Cayenne and I would find ourselves tennis partners in the winning doubles match of the Herb Cayenne Celebrity Tournament, hosted by my own tennis club. Our finances, meanwhile, were taking a sharp downward turn. Business was not going well at the Clark Door Company. The problem was that we were located in the middle of the peninsula, and the building boom had washed over us to engulf San Jose some fifty miles south. That was just too far for me to go in search of accounts, and George Clark, his brother Alice and I were struggling to save the jobs of half a dozen expert cabinet makers and millmen on the payroll. By 1968 we were working hard just to keep the doors open. Luckily, I stumbled onto a small enclave of hungry customers in Half Moon Bay, just over the coastal range, which our competitors had somehow overlooked. John's job was wearing a bit thin at the same time. As all of us do periodically, she felt that she was overworked and underpaid, and, as the office manager, she had no place to advance to fortunately too. Her company selected her to attend a seminar in New York, which perked up her spirits and gave her a renewed sense of accomplishment. For the moment, both her job and mine were limping along, but we could sense a change approaching. Just when we had adjusted to the temporary tedium of our jobs, we faced a new family problem. Lynn and David broke up, which confirmed our worst fears about her motives in the first place. But we were unprepared for her new direction. First, she disappeared into the drug culture of the Height Ashbury district. Soon we learned that she had joined a commune in San Francisco, and Jean and I were torn about what to do. If we interfered, Lynn might become even more resentful, and if we didn't, she might cause herself serious harm. Eventually we went to the commune to see for ourselves. The address turned out to be a dark, depressing old house where a dozen pale young kids sat around in moody pursuit of their own thing. One look at Lynn's thin, pale face, and we decided to take her home. I think she had had enough of the hippie life and came home without argument. A few weeks of rest and Jean's good cooking and her colour began to return, but not her willingness to live in a structured household. Soon she was off on another generational bender that eventually led to a hitchhiking tour through Europe, across Canada and the United States, to Big Sur, California. Our problem with Lynn had little to do with her hippie lifestyle, 
but rather her bent toward what seemed to us to be self-destruction. In fact, Jean and I rather enjoyed the youth movement since it reflected our own attitudes of allowing people to follow their personal lifestyles, so long as nobody demanded that others do the same. We were attracted to the gentleness of the culture, to its emphasis on peace, love and racial equality. I found that I liked my longer hair and turtleneck sweaters as Jean did her mini skirts and 12-string guitar. It was California in the late 1960s, after all, and Berkeley was less than an hour away. Peace and equality were not generational issues, and Jean and I, middle-aged hippies, marched and demonstrated with the best of them. Like any avant-garde movement, we knew we were in the right and were willing to stand behind our beliefs, though why I wasn't concerned about being arrested during a routine demonstration still amazes me. We had paid our dues to society over the years and were only standing up for the principles by which we had always lived. As the hippie movement evolved back into the mainstream so did, we, confident that our participation had helped bring about a stronger sense of democracy in America. We also learned that one doesn't have to wear a black turtleneck sweater and a string of wooden beads to live a life of freedom and independence. By 1968, Clark Door Company had finally gone under, and I was fortunate to get a job with a plywood and door outfit in Mountain View. The building boom had definitely bottomed out on the peninsula, and I knew it was time to move to a new area or consider starting a new career. Jean was also getting restless and was daydreaming about new adventures. Lynn was gone again, and Mark was soon to graduate from Cubberley High School. It seemed like the right time to change. What finally convinced us, I think, was watching Jean's friend Barbara Dolan, a secretary in her office, and her husband Joe, chuck the hustle and bustle of the peninsula and open a bar and restaurant in a shopping centre in Rio del Mar. They named it The Wind Jammer. Like Jean and I, they were adventurous, though certainly in a bigger league. Both were real risk-takers, high-rolling entrepreneurs who dabbled in such things as million-dollar developments in La Paz, Mexico. They had moved to Rio del Mar only months before we did, and regardless of our various moves, we remained good friends over the years. One weekend, Jean and I drove down the coast past Santa Cruz to Rio del Mar to give them a helping hand before the opening. I helped Joe hoist an old rowboat over the bar, and Jean and Barbara arranged the kitchen supplies. The atmosphere was heavy with salt air, and the sounds of seagulls shrieking overhead made us wonder why we were going back to our routine lives in Palo Alto. I wasn't really surprised several months later when Jean announced that she had found a great house in Rio del Mar and began a campaign to convince me to move. Frankly, it wasn't difficult. The owner and developer, Dan Succi, was anxious to sell us the home, and the area was an idyllic coastal paradise. We moved into our new place in 1970, my job in Mountain View also had finally fallen victim to the construction slump, and I had to find a new job soon. Jean was commuting to her office in Palo Alto every day, a horrible drive through the dangerous curves of old Highway 17. She was approaching her tenth year with Mutual of New York and was talking about retiring. We could live on her salary for a while, but it was clear that we both were in the market for change. But what could we do in this small, remote coastal village? I drove around the community looking for some evidence of a local industry that might hire me, but saw little to encourage me. Rio del Mar was a resort community for the San Francisco Peninsula and the wealthy growers who came to escape the heat of the San Joaquin Valley. Modern white buildings literally hung on high cliffs above the Pacific Ocean, and country clubs vied with one another for prestige and affluence. The opening celebrations at exclusive seaside condominiums like Shore del Mar attracted a host of local celebrities. On the fringes of the community were a few motels, their vacancy signs out during the dead winter months, and an old hot dog stand doing a little business with strollers on the beach. Not much in the way of employment for a construction estimator. I decided that I would fall back on my tennis background and try for a job as a tennis pro at one of the posh country clubs. I literally opened the yellow pages and turned to the first entry, Beavers Swim and Racquet Club. I called and learned that they were indeed in the market for a part-time pro. 
But to get the job, they said, you have to beat our outgoing pro. I hadn't played any serious tennis in years, and I was a bit out of shape. Golf had been our game in Palo Alto. As a matter of fact, I had trouble squeezing into my old white shorts. Still, I had been a tournament class player a decade before and gave it a try. Mr. and Miss Beaver introduced me to Dewey Raburn, Jr., the current pro, whom I had to beat to get the job. He was about my age, in his late forties, nearing retirement from the telephone company and a fine tennis player. This was going to be a tough match. Guests and players gathered around the court as Dewey and I shook hands and squared off. It turned out to be one of the most gruelling matches I remembered playing. Two middle-aged veterans, one of whom was decidedly out of shape, who were playing not for money or prestige, but pride. We were more than evenly matched, and each of us had a lifetime of sophisticated moves and tricks to draw upon. He won the first set, then I rallied and won the second. I was approaching the very limits of my endurance. My mind remembered what to do, but my body had forgotten. It was anybody's game as we arrived at the third and final set. Red-faced and panting, I hunched over to begin the last volley. I took a last look at the crowd gathered on the bleachers, and to my great delight, I saw Lynn waving her clasped hands over her head for luck. What a surprise! John had evidently mentioned that I was playing this match, and Lynn had decided to take a Sunday afternoon drive from San Francisco to cheer me on. After six years of rebellious behaviour, this was the most moving symbol of her relationship with me. It was a small gesture, I know, but Lynn's unexpected appearance at my tennis debut dissolved the hostility between us and shored up our relationship for years to come. Her visit was doubly welcome, since I won the final set and the match. I got the job. I was now the tennis pro at Beaver's Swim and Raquet Club a social position of no small importance in a resort community. Dewey and I, by the way, became fast friends and eventually partners in organising successful celebrity and international tournaments. My new job involved providing tennis lessons and lots of socialising. When I wasn't teaching on the courts, I strolled around the lovely terraced grounds and the Olympic-sized swimming pool chatting with the guests. It was part of my job and fun besides. It was also relaxing to know that few policemen and FBI agents earned enough money to belong to such an exclusive club, and that the chances that any of the guests had ever seen a post office bulletin board were remote. The club did have a problem, however, which was caused by its very exclusiveness. Membership was currently at low ebb, which meant that my teaching schedule was fairly light. That meant that I had lots of spare time. I used that time to develop an interesting project. It began when I discovered that Mr. and Mrs. Beaver had saved every issue of Tennis Magazine for the last two decades. It occurred to me that these several hundred magazines contained thousands of action pictures of the top players in the world, and that I might be able to isolate some common denominators that could help to make my students better players. I went through every magazine dozens of times, checking the body and racquet positions of each photograph to see what they had in common. It took time, but I eventually came up with five composites of the most successful strokes and body positions. I drew slow-motion diagrams of each type of swing, analysing the shift in position that brought the maximum force and accuracy into play, and wrote an accompanying text for novice and advanced players alike. The final result was an impressive booklet called Total Tennis that the club enthusiastically published and distributed widely to other tennis clubs. In retrospect, I must have been feeling supremely confident to have worked so hard to allow my name and photograph to reach such wide circulation. It was a risky thing to do. While I was thrilled to know that my tennis insights were useful to many players, I was aghast at my recklessness. I sweated bullets for weeks after the pamphlet appeared all over the peninsula, wondering who might look at my picture, see a glimmer of recognition think about it for a few days, and bingo. I calmed myself by remembering how much I had changed in 25 years. First of all, I was 50 years old, a far cry from the tall, skinny kid who served in Hitler's army. I had sported crew cuts and long hair, gained weight and lost it again, developed wrinkles and a paunch. 
I was hardly the same man. Moreover, I had recently grown a small Van Dyke beard, a souvenir from a whitewater rafting trip down the treacherous Stanislaus River with Jan the summer before. But to put my photograph on the cover of a published pamphlet, beard or not, was dumb. My FBI files reveal that there had been a substantial drop-off in interest after the capture of my last comrade, Kurt Westfall, in May of 1964. I had no idea, of course, that I was now the last fugitive German prisoner of war in America, and to tell the truth, I am glad that I didn't know. Whenever I got depressed or frightened by the thought that I had made a slip or was just tired of lying to Jean, I drew strength from the thought that I wasn't alone and that my four other comrades were going through the same experiences. I felt they were somehow counting on me, but now I was the last fugitive. More than thirty years had passed since I escaped from Camp Deming, wild-eyed with fear and running across the ghostly white desert toward an approaching freight train. Now here I was, a middle-aged American, married and with a family, and in the early 1970s a tennis pro at one of the most exclusive country clubs in the county. That was the confidence that led me to publish my tennis booklet, photograph and all. It was true that the FBI had not made much progress since Westfall's capture, but they were far from finished. My wanted poster still hung in every post office, and official memos about me moved regularly between Washington and the FBI district office. One encouraging note was beginning to appear in my files, speculation about the possibility that I was dead. Given the fact that two decades had passed since I escaped, the prospect was reasonable. Moreover, if the FBI declared me dead, they could close the file. Another case solved. The Albuquerque, New Mexico office was especially hopeful for such a solution, since it had been made responsible for my case. I was becoming an embarrassment. Several times during the mid-1960s, the Albuquerque office petitioned Washington to have me declared dead and removed from their caseload. Finally, they received a brusque memo from J. Edgar Hoover, denying their request to sweep the matter under the rug. His only concession was to place my case on an inactive status. Consequently, agents continued to routinely check the telephone directories for any spelling of the name Georg Gertner and thoroughly investigated every reported sighting. My wanted posters stayed up. What inactive status really meant was that a single verifiable sighting would bring the situation to full alert at any time. I got a real scare in the early spring of 1971. Jean and I had moved again, from Rio del Mar to a lovely place a dozen miles south at San Dollar Beach. Jean had been getting restless, and after thinking about it for a couple of weeks, I realised that I was restless as well. Mark was off studying political science at the University of California at Santa Barbara, and Lynn was off to Europe. We only had to worry about the two of us. The move was uneventful, and we continued to commute to work, Jan all the way to Palo Alto every morning and still dreaming of retiring from Moni and Ito, the Beavers Country Club. There was a small community called Aptos between our new home at San Dollar and Rio del Mar, and I developed the habit of stopping at Cabrillo College in Aptos to jog on quiet afternoons. After a few months, I knew many of the joggers and enjoyed meeting old and new friends on the path. One day I was joined by a fellow about my age, and we struck up a conversation as we jogged the course across the campus. He was a foreigner, I could tell by his strong accent, probably German or Austrian. He explained that he was in the United States for a month to attend a business conference being held at Cabrillo College and that he was indeed from Germany. I had long ago reached the point where I considered myself totally American and didn't feel the least bit apprehensive about the situation. Still, he kept looking at me, at first out of the corner of his eye, and soon he was really staring. I don't like strangers to take an undue interest in me, and I was beginning to get nervous. What the hell is on this guy's mind? I kept wondering to myself. He looked bewildered and seemed to want to talk about something. At the end of the three-mile path, we slowed to a walk to catch our breath. He apparently decided to broach whatever subject he had been mulling over. After reintroducing himself and telling me again that he was from Germany, 
he explained that he had been in the 15th Panzer Division in Africa during the Second World War, my division, and wondered if I might have been there as well. I looked familiar to him, and he thought we had met there. I was thunderstruck. Not in my wildest dreams could I have imagined such a situation. A member of my old Africa Corps unit, here in California? Thirty years later, I simply went blank. I should have considered that it was always possible. More than a hundred thousand of us fought under Field Marshal Rommel in North Africa. Thousands more passed through as support troops on temporary assignment. There was always constant movement of men and the appearance of new faces. Doubtless we had crossed paths somewhere, perhaps in training or en route through Italy, Yugoslavia, Greece and Crete, or during any of the battles or lulls of the terrible retreat toward Tunisia. He couldn't quite place me, he said, but he was pretty sure it was in North Africa. Was I there too? he asked. It was fortunate that we had just finished running, and I could hide my astonishment by pretending to catch my breath. It was as though my mind had short-circuited. I just couldn't think of the right answer. Finally, I managed to catch my breath long enough to tell him that he must have me mixed up with somebody else. I had never been in North Africa, I told him, and had certainly never been in the German army. I started to turn away toward my car, and he tried once again, this time taking my arm and saying something in German. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. I pulled loose as politely as I could and strode to my car and sped away. I doubt if my heart stopped racing until I reached my front door in San Dollar half an hour later. When I finally locked myself in and calmed down, I realised that the danger had passed. He couldn't remember my old name, and I doubt if he heard me say my new name. Even if he did, there was no way to connect Kriegsoffizier Bewerber Georg Gertner of Hitler's Africa Corps with Dennis Wiles of Sand Dollar Beach, California. I also reminded myself that he was only in the United States for the month, and once he left, I was perfectly safe. In the meantime, I steered clear of Cabrillo College with a vengeance, and even decided to give up jogging for a while on the off chance that I might run into him on some other jogging path. After the panic subsided, I noticed a curious reaction to the whole event. I was almost convinced that he really did have me mixed up with somebody else, a part of me knew that he was talking about me. We were doubtless in the same unit in North Africa. In a way, I was sorry that we couldn't share those experiences once again. They were the best of times and the worst of times, the heroism and defeat that led me to a new life. Above all, it was the high adventure of my young manhood. I would have dearly loved to have discussed those years with a comrade who went through it with me. If that man is today listening these words, I hope he understands why I acted as I did. At the same time, I was annoyed that he would think that I had ever been in the German army. Thirty years had passed and I was a different person. I had so completely amputated my past that I half believed he had made a mistake. I was almost insulted that he would think that I, a devoted American, would have served in the Wehrmacht. I didn't even understand the German words he was speaking. As curious as it may be, I was literally a different person. Still, it was a terrific shock to bump into an Africa Corps veteran who remembered me from the old days, even if there was no immediate danger. I only wished that I could have told Jean why I was so shaken and introspective when she came home from work. Work, in fact, was becoming a problem for both of us. Jean wanted to retire at the first opportunity, which meant when I found a job that would support us. Until then, she grudgingly agreed to carry us a little longer. It was time for me to decide. We both enjoyed the social prestige of my job as the tennis pro at Beavers and unashamedly gloried in the local limelight. I also relished the opportunity to publish my pamphlet on total tennis. On the other hand, community status didn't pay the bills. I was certainly never going to become a millionaire this way. Jean and I began discussing the possibilities of quitting our jobs and going into something local and lucrative. We found what we were looking for at the exclusive Aptos Country Club. It was the in-place for wealthy golfers, as Sugar Bowl was for skiers. The club catered to people who shunned the opulent golf courses on the Monterey Peninsula in favour of a smaller club with a personal touch. 
most returned year after year. What Aptos did not have, however, was a tennis club. Tennis was becoming more popular by the day. Given this growing popularity but few available public courts, John and I felt that it would be a perfect place to start a racket club. They had 500 acres of dormant real estate where we visualised a pro shop, restaurant and rows of tennis courts. The potential was clearly there, and with my tennis skills and John's business ability, we couldn't lose. What we needed, however, was the enthusiastic support of the Aptos Country Club and, from whatever source, some investment capital. Aptos, it turned out, was delighted with our proposal. They knew we would bring in business. Aside from the courts at Cabrillo College and the few public courts downtown, our new tennis club would be the only place in town. Aptos would gain new members, not to mention the profits from a pro shop, the restaurant and bar. They could sell lots to wealthy home builders. Moreover, if we could encourage tennis organisations to hold their matches and tournaments at Aptos, the reputation of the club would benefit. The other reason they were so cooperative was that the manager of Aptos, Boyd Lang, turned out to be a friend of mine. Boyd had once developed a huge housing project near Novato in Marin County and had been my account when I worked for Herb. Great idea, he said. It's fine with us. See if you can find some investment money. The money came from a new acquaintance, Walter Field, a wealthy young man whose main interests were tennis and banking. It didn't take me long to show him how the two passions could be combined. Before long, Jean and I were in business. I gave notice at Beavers, and Jean gratefully retired from Moni. We opened a small shop at the entrance to the lodge, which Jean named the Tennis Scene. We hurriedly stocked it with tennis fashions, imported Austrian sweaters, courtesy of Bill and Fred Klein, and a few rackets and warm-up suits. I tried to introduce my aluminum Dennis racket through my shop as well, but it still didn't take off. Our little tennis world quickly became a behave of activity. Dewey Raburn came by and joined Ed, as did Lowell and Yvonne Welch and many of our other friends. Soon we were offering a variety of instruction packages and even sponsored sports fashion shows. By the end of our first year, I was teaching classes totaling hundreds of people, mainly youngsters. And during the off-season winter months, I taught many of the same kids, ski courses organised on the sand dunes of the local beaches. When Mark had college vacations, he came to work as my assistant instructor in both sports, Things were going so well that I had to worry about pacifying the large golfing population of the club, which felt it was being eclipsed by our intrusion. Jean and I tried to mend fences at every opportunity, participating in their golfing tournaments and fashion shows. Jean and I revelled in the social life of the community. We entertained regularly and were invited to every party, sports tournament and condominium opening. New friendships abounded, Ed and Marge Fawcett, for example. Ed was a retired Volvo dealer and an accomplished oil painter, later to become my art teacher. Marge was an outgoing bubbly blonde who enthusiastically helped Jan with fashion shows. They had a beautiful winter condominium in Hawaii, at Lahaina on the island of Maui, and after several joint trips there with them, eventually convinced us to move to Hawaii permanently. We also developed a close friendship with Lee Hill, a tennis player and real estate developer in Rio del Mar and Pebble Beach. Lee invited us regularly to play at the elegant Pebble Beach Country Club, where we could mingle with the celebrities who retreated there to escape the pressures of public life. People like Clint Eastwood, Merv Griffin, Gene Hackman and Ephraim Zimbalist, Jr. Another important friend was Peter Herb, the executive director of the Northern California Tennis Association. Peter later appointed me the director of the Junior Davis Cup team of Santa Cruz County and sanctioned the junior and pro tournaments that were held at my tennis club. I had arrived. I even basked in the appearance of front-page spreads in the local Watsonville newspapers, the Pajeronian and the Sun Press, which lauded us as the pace-setters of the year. Georg Gertner was a million miles away, it was in this rarefied atmosphere that I crossed paths with Joe Cinciolo, the cherry wholesaler from Stockton, for whom I had worked nearly 25 years before, loading cherries into boxcars for shipment to New York. 
He recognised me immediately as Peter Peterson, the Norwegian immigrant lumberjack, and of course, I recognised him. I lived in terror for weeks, waiting for the moment when the FBI would walk into my tennis shop as they did with poor Reinhold Pabel in his Chicago bookstore back in 1953 and arrest me in front of my friends. It took a month or more before I felt safe enough to look up at each new customer without fearing that he would hold out a badge and quietly suggest that we walk to a waiting car. Luckily, nothing happened, and after a month or so, I put the whole matter out of my mind. It was time to get back to the high life. The owners of the Aptos Country Club, reportedly the Teamsters Union, were genuinely impressed with the success of our tennis activity. Boyd Lang had since moved on and was replaced by a new management team. To my initial joy, they decided that we were doing well enough to make a separate tennis centre. Our new name was the Aptos Sea Scape Racquet Club, and the management embarked on an impressive project designed to attract national championship tournaments and wealthy resort homeowners. Aptos was run by people who went first class. The new facilities included six regular tennis courts, a floodlit sunken championship arena with bleacher seating for 1,100 people, a 75-foot junior-sized swimming pool, a bar and restaurant for private members, locker rooms with whirlpool baths and sauna, and an entire building devoted to the pro shops of the new tennis director, Dennis Wiles. Huge bulldozers were brought in, and the groundbreaking ceremony took place at the beginning of the summer, 1971. What a festival! Tennis celebrities and socialites came from miles around to enjoy the special exhibition matches by such luminaries as Barry McKay, former leading-ranked U.S. tennis pro, Gil Rodriguez, former NCAA tennis champion and the pro at Hawaii Kai Racquet Club, my pal Dewey Raburn, director of the Northern California Tennis Association, and yours truly. A bunch of area sports reporters were also there, but I wasn't concerned. It was hardly smart behaviour for a man who was sought by the FBI, but I was just having too much fun to care about it. In September, Peter Herb arranged for our first sanctioned tournament. This was an important milestone at Seascape, because a tournament authorised by the US Lawn Tennis Association made the scores official and players eligible to compete towards state and national championships. The Aptos Corporation put up an awesome $30,000 in prize money and we hosted the first annual Seascape Senior Doubles Gold Championship. We were on our way. No sooner was that tournament over than Dewey, Peter Herb and I organised the Santa Cruz Junior Davis Cup Championships. More celebrities, entertainment and sports reporters. The next tournament materialised from an unexpected direction and turned out to be humorously ironic. It also created an incident that started the deterioration of my relationship with the Aptos management. One day I was approached by a well-dressed older man with a gorgeous starlet on his arm. He introduced himself as Al Haber from Santa Cruz, and the doll as the future Mrs Haber. What I want to talk to you about is you and I putting on a celebrity tournament at Seascape, with the proceeds going to charity. You do the organising, he said, and with a broad wink to the actress on his arm added, and I'll furnish the celebrities. Talk about luck. Here was a guy who wanted to help underwrite a major tournament at my club and with me as the organiser. It was almost my tournament. John was apprehensive about the responsibility of such a huge project, but the challenge was too seductive. Al Haber and I talked it over and shook hands. We set the dates for May 5-7, 1972. First, we set up a committee to select a celebrity to bear the name of the tournament. It had to be a Californian, of course, and someone known to play an excellent game of tennis. The committee selected Herb Kayan of the San Francisco Chronicle, highly respected and a well-known tennis enthusiast. How ironic. Almost ten years before, he wrote about Georg Gartner walking the streets of San Francisco. Now he would actually meet him. The charity we chose was the Dominican Hospital in Santa Cruz, and of course, they were delighted. We unleashed a publicity blitz that brought in droves of local celebrities, TV personalities and newspapers columnists, and even football stars from as far as San Francisco. 
We enlisted the help of a number of former Davis Cup players, and the general public enthusiastically paid $5 per person to watch them play in exhibition matches. Even though I was the resident pro, I saw no reason not to enter the tournament with a celebrity partner. That decision, while certainly legal, led to a problem. Herb Kahn and I won. The management was furious. All that publicity and expense wasted, they contended, because the tournament looked rigged. Nobody else seemed the least bit concerned. There was no prize money after all, and all the profits went to the hospital. Nonetheless, the management seemed soured by the event, and we began to avoid each other. The Aptos management was not the only source of anger in my life. Jean was getting angry too. While I was out on the courts, poor Jean was stuck running the pro shop and worrying about things like inventories and sales tax. She was supporting me, as always, and getting damned irritated about it. We had also been working side by side every day for more than a year, and the strain was beginning to show. I didn't know it at the time, but she was also growing suspicious about my past. A lot of things didn't jibe, and they were beginning to add up. It began with my slip-up at the wedding about not having been married before as I had originally told her. Then, a physical examination through her Moni insurance revealed that I had once had serious cases of both diphtheria and pneumonia, neither of which I had ever told her about. The medical report also discussed the remnants of a nasty break on my sheen, which I had also neglected to mention. I just didn't seem to have a past, and it was getting to her. I knew it, but what could I do? I knew our relationship was drifting toward trouble but didn't want to open the gates to a full-blown crisis. Instead, I made believe that the growing tension was simply due to our overwork. If there really was a problem, I figured it was only temporary. Meanwhile, life went on, a whirlwind of teaching tennis, organising tournaments and playing exhibition matches to promote Aptos Seascape. One match turned out to be unique. It was the only time I intentionally lost. My friend Walter Field, the banker, invited me to be his doubles partner at his annual alumni tournament at Stanford. Walter took Stanford University as seriously as he took tennis and banking, so I was honoured to have been asked. We played well together and made it to the finals. Walter was overjoyed. He was a tough competitor and loved to win. He was even happier to be winning at his alumni reunion. We had about an hour's break before the final match, which we stood an excellent chance of winning. While waiting, I decided to stroll around the hallowed halls of Stanford and eventually found myself standing in front of the large brass plaque on which the names of each year's alumni winners were engraved. I visualised the next entry, 1972, Walter Field and Dennis Wiles. Suddenly I felt so guilty. I was struck by the permanence of what was about to happen. Walter and I were about to win the Alumni Doubles Championship, and our names would be forever linked on this imposing plaque. It would have been sacred to Walter. The prospect of tarnishing his moment made me squirm. What if I was caught some day? I might become an embarrassment to Walter. My arrest would certainly shock my friends and tennis colleagues, not to mention my wife. But I always felt that once they knew the circumstances, they would get over it. I think that Walter would also understand, but it would have blemished his winning moment at Stanford. As I walked back to begin the finals, I started to feel sick. It was psychological, of course. I didn't want to win. I know that I talked myself into it, but I really thought I was ill. I could hardly lift my racket to serve. We lost, although we both knew that our opponents were not as good as we. Walter was bitterly disappointed, but forgave me. I hope he'll still be as understanding after listening these words. Incidentally, while I was congratulating our opponents directly after the match, a photographer from Sports Illustrated appeared. He wanted a few pictures of the tournament winners for the next issue. This will be seen from coast to coast, he assured us, and politely asked if Walter and I might step aside for a moment while he took the picture. Just hearing the words will be seen from coast to coast was enough for me. I graciously moved away and silently thanked heaven that I had lost the tournament. In September 1972, we hit the big time. After lengthy negotiations with the Northern California Tennis Association and the National U.S. Lawn Tennis Association, 
Seascape was allowed to host its first international tournament, the Grand Prix. This was serious stuff. Players from all over the world competed for the tournament championship, including several from behind the Iron Curtain. Among the most impressive entries was a rising young Swedish star named Bjorn Borg, who did not win the top money, Jan Kodes from Czechoslovakia, and such well-known American players as Dennis Ralston and Bob Lutz. It was the professional gathering of the season in Northern California. My role this time was as the official referee. Everything went great until I was called in to settle a court dispute and all eyes were suddenly on me. During one of the matches, another player from Czechoslovakia became outraged at the umpire's call. He threw his racket on the ground and called the umpire, who happened to be black, you black son of a bitch. Suddenly the whole tournament froze. Tennis is an aristocratic sport where etiquette and gallantry are as important as skill. Winners and losers shake hands over the net at the end. Throwing one's racket and insulting the umpire during a match, especially a sanctioned international tournament, is a gross violation of accepted behaviour. The more so when the insult is a racial slur. The official was understandably outraged and demanded that the player be thrown out of the match. The Czech claimed that he didn't speak any English and that the words he shouted didn't mean anything to him. The umpire refused to budge on the call. Both turned to me as the official referee and suddenly sports reporters, club officials and the packed bleachers all focused on my decision. This was my nightmare. Several thousand people were breathlessly awaiting a decision that was bound to outrage one side or the other. I could imagine the sports headlines. International incident occurred today at Aptos Seascape between a black American umpire and a Czech champion. The official ruling was made by referee Dennis Wiles, a fugitive German prisoner of war. After consulting with both the Czech and the umpire, I ruled that the umpire's original decision was correct, but that the Czech's insult did not warrant dismissal from the tournament. I thought it was the best decision under the circumstances. While my ruling was later supported by the National Office, I waited in anguish for our photos to appear in the papers. A few papers carried the story, but gratefully there were no further ramifications. Despite all the tournaments and publicity for Aptos Seascape, my relations with the club management were deteriorating fast. I believed that one of the management team saw my efforts to bring in major tournaments as high-handed, and that he was still annoyed by me having won the finals match of the Herb Cain Celebrity Tournament. But I suspect that the real problem was that business had fallen off, and fewer homeowners were buying lots at Aptos. Perhaps the tennis club was getting too popular, and those in authority were under pressure from the club's powerful golf lobby. Whatever the reason, I felt that I was in a narrowing shoot. There were already rumours that they were on the lookout for a younger and more subservient tennis director. In mid-1973 it was announced, imperiously it seemed to me, that they had hired a travelling pro, a young Davis Cup player by the name of Eric Van Dillen. I felt sure that I was in for a squeeze play. Not that it was unusual for a prestigious country club to have a travelling tennis or golf pro in addition to its resident pro. In fact, it was a good idea. A travelling pro, especially one with Van Dillen's solid qualifications and public appeal, could only enhance the reputation of his home club as he participated in tournaments around the country. What bothered me was that it was done without my knowledge. Such a breach of sports etiquette confirmed my fear that my days at Aptos were numbered. Consequently, I was grateful when I was unexpectedly invited to participate in a major tennis match, the Alamo Pro-Am Fireman's Fund Tournament at the Alamo Country Club at Walnut Creek. It was impressive to be invited to play at such a prestigious match under any circumstances, but because of my relationship with club management, it was vital that I demonstrate my ability and take every opportunity to enhance my reputation. The Alamo Pro-Am tournament turned out even better than I had hoped. I was playing in the company of the best professional players in California and was assured of several invitations to still more tournaments in the future. At Alamo, I also got a chance to play with Robert Stack. When Jean and I had lunch with him, his wife, Rosemary, and Mrs. Edgar Bergen afterward, I reminded him that I had once cooked his hamburgers, 25 years before, 
at the ski lodge at Sugar Bowl. To my astonishment, he remembered me and Tim, the bartender. One invitation that followed was to the impressive James MacArthur Celebrity Tournament in Hawaii the following summer, 1974, where I was to be, ahem, the tournament tennis coordinator. John and I left on our annual vacation in January that year to beautiful Hawaii, buoyed up with optimism. Surely the management of Aptos couldn't justify replacing me now. After several wonderfully relaxing weeks in Hawaii, we returned to the tension of Aptos seascape. I was reasonably sure that the management was pacified by my recent tennis successes. I looked forward to a pleasant and challenging new year. The first important sports event upon our return was the annual Aptos Country Club Awards Ceremony. It was a fun weekend that culminated in the presentation of the awards. At the end of the awards ceremony, one of the managers rose to make a special announcement. Aptos Seascape was pleased to announce the name of its new resident tennis pro, Henry Kamakana. The number one ranked player in Northern California. There was a smattering of applause across the packed bleachers. Jean and I were stunned. I had just been fired. As the crowds realised what had happened, a number of people looked toward me with perplexed expressions on their faces. Why I hadn't mentioned my departure before. Jean and I were still in shock and could only shrug back in bewilderment. An angry exchange with my boss afterward proved fruitless. Kamakana was the new tennis pro and I was out. No reason, no explanation. We went home in smouldering fury to consider our future. Clearly there was no way to remain at Aptos. My pride would never allow me to plead, and management wouldn't have me anyway. The only consolation was that most of my friends would quit in a huff, and I hoped that the club would feel the loss of business. I also took some comfort in the fact that I was being replaced by one of the best. Henry Kamakana was a top-flight player from Hawaii, whose father, incidentally, was a highly respected teaching pro at the Mauna Kea Resort until well into his seventies. If I had to be replaced, I figured that they had to go to the top of the ranks to do it. Once the shock and embarrassment had passed, we had to do some serious planning. It was clear that it was time to move to a new area. Neither of us felt comfortable there any longer. And where would we get new jobs? We liked our tennis lifestyle and had proved that we were good at it. We had created a tennis club from scratch. We had maintained a successful pro shop, organised major tournaments, provided lessons and orchestrated well-attended sports events and fashion shows. We brought in a lot of business. Now that we had the experience, Jean and I decided we could do the same thing somewhere else. Moreover, since we could avoid many of our earlier mistakes, we could do it better. Money wouldn't be an immediate problem. We would make a substantial profit on our beautiful house in Sand Dollar Beach, since the property values in the area were skyrocketing. The kids were long gone, so we were entirely mobile. Mark had graduated from Santa Barbara and was learning the hotel business. He was the front desk manager at a Holiday Inn. Lynn had drifted to Boulder, Colorado, after several years of self-searching at Big Sur, and was happy with her new husband, Bob Bauer. There didn't seem to be anything holding us back. The big question was, where would we go? Jean spread the maps on the kitchen table, and we began the exciting process of selecting our new home. Our goal was a wealthy resort community, where tennis was popular and courts were scarce. We settled on the nearby town of Salinas, some fifty miles south of us, not far from Monterrey. After discussing all the pros and cons, we agreed. Salinas it is. A new adventure. Rubbing our hands in excitement, we embarked on the familiar routine. We put the house on the market and sold it quickly for even more than we hoped. Now we had investment capital of our own. We put our belongings in storage until we found a new house and jobs in Salinas. Now came the hard part. We had to say goodbye again. Our friends at Aptos Seascape threw a lovely farewell party for us, and several hundred members turned out to wish us well in our new venture. 